Okay, I'm Scott Dahman of uh, Power Wolf Corporation, and uh, joining me is our uh, company founder, Professor Thomas Overby, who's now with the uh, Texas A&M University, just uh, started this semester there. So um, on screen right now, we have just the plan for today. Uh, we revised it a little bit from what was sent out earlier, just to uh, accommodate Tom's travel schedule. So uh, it's, we're going to start off, uh, Professor Overby is going to talk about some GMD, basic GMD theory, uh, geomagnetic disturbance, and uh, geomagnetic induced current modeling. And then I will do the second part, which will involve some hands-on examples in Power World Simulator and just how, w what data you need to put into Simulator and what kind of results you get out of Simulator when you're, you're doing these simulations. Uh, we'll take a break. And then following the break, uh, Professor Oobie will come in and talk about uh, kind of what we're developing going forward, future studies, uh, using transient stability time frame to model the E3 effects of EMP and some of the theory behind that. And then I'll do some examples with some transient stability uh, modeling of the GMD effects in the transient stability time frame in the simulator. So... Uh, with that, I'll start Tom's uh, first presentation. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Tom Overby. I uh, started Power World, actually started developing a software that became Power World back in 1987 when I was starting graduate school, and I've been work, working on it in one form or another ever since. I uh, was the guy that got the GIC stuff added in with the initial work done in summer of 2011, and then we've been continuing to extend it ever since. Um, after 25 wonderful years at University of Illinois, I did retire at the end of 2016, and I moved down to College Station, Texas, to work for Texas A&M, which is a really nice place to be in January. <laughs> I will say that. Um, whether it will be nice in the summer, I don't know. Uh, Okay, so we're going to talk about geomagnetic disturbance modeling. This is meant to be very interactive, so if you have questions or whatever, uh, feel free to, to say it. GMDs are part of what NERC calls high-impact, low-frequency events. Uh, NERC identified a couple of them back in, I think it was a report from 2010, they identified coordinated cyber or blunt or physical or blended attacks, pandemics uh, like the flu. Not that the grid gets sick, but the people that operate the grid get sick <laughs> and can't do it. Uh, GMDs and high altitude electromagnetic pulses. Another could be volcanic eruptions. Certainly, that would impact you guys out in this area um, more than it would in Illinois or Texas. What we're going to talk about today are primarily GMDs, but GMDs have a lot of tie-in with the high-altitude electromagnetic pulses, which are an uh, area of current interest. So I'll talk about how we can use Power World for that as well towards the end. Actually, between a GMD and an HEMP, a lot of the analysis is similar. It's just at the beginning that it's different. So GMDs are naturally occurring phenomena. They're caused by corona or solar corona mass ejections, or what we call CMEs. So they come off the sun. Um, a pretty big one occurred in 1989, and that caused the Quebec blackout. The concern with these is they have the potential to disrupt grid operations and perhaps damage high-voltage equipment by causing uh, what we affectionately say are GICs, which are geomagnetically induced currents. So we'll be talking about GICs and how you calculate uh, GICs quite a bit. I first really got into this in 2011. I went out to a Jason presentation. Um, Jason is this uh, bunch of university professors that meet out in La Jolla, California and study different problems. I gave a presentation on uh, GMDs there in 2011 and learned a lot in the process. And coming out of that meeting, I realized that this was something that we could put into Power World and actually give tools to engineers to help them assess the impact of GMDs. So that's where it started with Power World, and Power World was a leader in doing that. So we've since 
greatly expanded what we can do in the power flow, and we can also calculate the impact of GICs on the grid in the transient stability as well. So how do these CMEs cause problems? The CMEs are charged particles coming off the sun. They come off at speeds of between 1 and 3 million miles per hour. The, sun, the sun's 93 million miles away, so a fast one might get here in a day. A slow one might take a couple days. Uh, the fast ones tend to be the bigger ones. So periodically the sun emits these uh, particles. When they, when they come to the Earth's magnetic field, they actually perturb the magnetic field and it starts bouncing around. So what you get is you get a change in the magnetic flux density. Uh, if you remember back to earlier classes, what we call B. Um, so we get a dBdt. Anytime you get a dBdt changing magnetic field, that can induce an electrical field. Okay. So the changes in the magnetic flux on the Earth are usually expressed in nanoteslas per minute. So you get a change. Obviously, the Earth has a steady state magnetic field. That's what drives the compasses. And as you get a change in that, it can induce the electric fields going on. How much this electric field is depends on both the magnitude of the disturbance, how big the CME is, and also the response that occurs in the Earth. And the response in the Earth is something that uh, we talk about in intro electromagnetics classes called Lenz's Law. When you get a change in a flux, you get induced current that ch tends to oppose that change in flux. That induced current in the Earth depends on the conductivity of the Earth. But because these things are changing relatively slowly, we're looking at a nanotesla per minute variation. They look, they're very low frequency, so they penetrate far into the crust. So you have to know what's going on in the Earth's crust down potentially hundreds of kilometers. So from our point of view, they look essentially DC. They are changing, but they're changing much slower than the underlying 60 hertz AC system. The issue for the grid is because these are coming off the sun, they're big. And when they hit the earth, they have a big footprint. The footprint can be continental in scale. Uh, you can't really see it here, but this, this is North America there. <coughs> This is a recreation that John Kappelman published in IEEE Spectrum in February 2012. This is showing where the magnetic field is changing in the 1989 storm superimposed on uh, mostly the Western Hemisphere. This is kind of Canada up there, so it was affecting Quebec. He hypothesized that a larger storm that occurred in 1921 would have covered this region here which is going down past the Gulf or past the past Texas into the Gulf of Mexico. So you guys, WCC, would have been covered by that entire storm. The one that affected North America in 1989 produced a change of about 500 nanoteslas per minute, while a stronger storm, such as the one in 1859 or 1921, could produce 2,500 nanoteslas per minute. Now, when I first heard that, I was like, how on earth would anyone in 1859 know how big a storm occurred? And the answer is, there is some difficulty in determining the precise size of these storms, because there wasn't much sensing in 1859, but there was some, and the sum that they had was telegraph lines. And what they found is they could actually operate the telegraph lines without their batteries. So they knew how many volts they were getting on the line, even though in 1859 they didn't use the term volts. Uh, we were able to convert it back to what would be volts. So that allowed us to estimate this uh, storm size. But there's a lot of estimation here. Prior to 1859, there's essentially no hard data. These CMEs cause big uh, 
northern lights. So one proxy is you look at northern lights going back in historical records, but we just don't have a lot of data. So I'm trying to figure out from a grid perspective how bad a storm could we get. It's hard to say. Okay. The Earth's magnetic field is normally between 25,000 and 65,000 nanoteslas, so it cannot change at 2,500 nanoteslas per minute for very long. Okay, so it, these per perturbations make the field bounce kind of up and down. How yes. Does, how does the electro jet? Well, it, it's impacting the electrojet. So yeah, the electrojet is up in the ionosphere, and this is driving the electrojet, which is inducing the electric field on the ground, and hence the GICs. Yeah, and, and I, I will say, I'm a power engineer. I work with these space scientists who know a lot about the electrojet. That's not my stuff. I'm a grid guy. So uh, it, it, it's a very interdisciplinary problem. Yes, Tracy. Just want to point out that uh, four figures got off from NOAA. Uh -huh. Space weather guy that's going to come out here. So, this. So, normally this is, we would leave with them. If whack, we'd let it down. And then you show up. Yeah, that's okay. what we got to this time. So, someone's going to be available in a few months to talk to physics on yeah. space weather. That'll be good. Okay. I just had dinner last night with Jen Gannon, who's working with me on a couple projects. She used to be with the USGS. She is a ground modeler, so she's like an expert in modeling the ground. So you need the grid people and you need the ground people, and then you need to figure out from the space scientists how big these storms can be. We work with some guys at, when I was at University of Illinois, I guess I'm still working with them because they're on an NSF project that I'm on. One guy's Jonathan Mackala. I, I keep asking him, how large a storms can we get? And the answer is they're not sure. I mean, there's no, you, you go out, these are high impact but low frequency. So you get out, if you look at probability distributions on these storms, we're always getting little storms. Medium-sized ones occur much less. Big ones occur, there's one in 89, you know, one in 1921, 1859. So the sampling size is kind of small. And that's the trick that we have as a power industry to say, what, how large a storm should we study? Because what we'll see is the GICs are pretty much a DC system response. And if you remember back to circus class, DC system responses are linear. So if you double the size of the assumed electric field, you double the GICs. Triple it, you triple them. So it's a linear response. So how big the electric field is is a key issue, and it's not known for sure. Uh, about two and a half years ago, NASA said that in July of 2012, there was a very large solar corona mass ejection. And if the Earth had been in the right place in its orbit, or the wrong place, I mean, we were in a good place, it missed us, it would have been a really big storm. So this is a, a picture that NASA released. That's the sun right there. This is the Earth's orbit. And they were showing how the CME was coming off of the sun and it spirals out from the sun. And the reason why it spirals is because the sun is rotating. So as the sun's rotating, I think it rotates once per day or something, for about 24 hours, it fires these charged particles off, and this is the Earth's orbit. So a whole bunch were crossing the Earth's orbit. You can see over here, if we had been over in this location, we would have got a lot of impact. If we had been two weeks further along, we would have got a really major storm, but it missed us. So the sun uh, goes through cycles. Most people know there's, an, there's sunspots and there's 11 year cycle on the sunspots and um, the solar activity kind of uh, varies with the sunspots. We are in what's called solar cycle 24 right now. Uh, the first numbered cycle was in 1755. 
this is a plot here of the number of sunspots over time, and you can see it goes up and down in 11-year cycles. There's longer-term variations that go on as well. Uh, there was something where evidently during this time period, there were very few sunspots. That was called the Marauder Minimum, and it corresponded to a little ice age, at least in Europe. Since then, there's ups and downs. There's an 11-year cycle, and then, then there's other cycles superimposed on that. Um, this one didn't come out too well, but this is a zoomed-in view of the last several cycles. We're just coming out of cycle 24 right now, which re reached its max in, uh, around the end of 2014, early 2015. But its peak was much lower than the other two peaks. So the other peaks here were higher, and this last one was lower. Um, the question is, does that have any ramifications for the large corona mass ejections? And the answer is probably not, because the historical data says that the large corona mass ejections are not well correlated with the sunspot maximums. This is the various solar cycles here, and the blue lines are showing where there are big storms. And there was one, I don't know if I can read this, the numbers here. That was the 89 storm. Okay, um, big storms don't necessarily occur when the, the sunspot number has reached its maximum. For example, the large 1921 storm occurred four years after the 1917 maximum. So in, in doing this GIC stuff, some people have said, when we were in this time moving into the maximum, they're like, oh yeah, we got to do a lot of stuff, 2011, 2012, 2013. Then as we peak, some people are saying, well, we'll see in 11 years. It's like, it doesn't work that way. We could have a big storm tomorrow. Okay. So where does that get us on the power grid? On the power grid, uh, NERC has been working in this area pretty actively for the last five, six years. And they have produced a assessment black diagram. And we're going to go through part of that assessment black diagram. The black diagram starts with a magnetic field B sub T there. You have an Earth conductivity model. That produces an electric field. The electric field, uh, you use a DC model of the system, and that lets you calculate the GICs. The GICs then go into the transformer model, which is produces uh, changes in reactive power. That can go into power flow analysis, and that gets you changes in bus voltages, line uh, loadings, and bar reserves, stuff like that. And the GICs also change the temperature on the transformers, so you have a thermal model right here for the transformers. Are we going to talk about thermal modeling? No, oh, a little bit. We have some resources on our website you can download, uh, but yeah, I'll mention it. Yeah, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start here, then I'll go back there, and then I'll go over here and get into powerful analysis. A lot of what Scott will be talking about is how do you actually do this part and this part in uh, power world itself. Okay. So we're going to do the DC model first. The DC model part assumes an electric field. So we're going to assume an electric field, and then later on we'll go back and we'll talk about where does that electric field come from. But let's assume an electric field. So this kind of gets back into what we talk about in intro circus class. It's actually relatively straightforward. If you have an electric field along a line, an electric field has a magnitude and it has an angle. Okay, at each point in space. The simplest sort of electric field is to consider is what's called a uniform electric field. 
that just means it's the same everywhere. So let's say we have an electric field that's the same everywhere. To calculate the voltage induced on any conductor, you just integrate the electric field along the length of the conductor. The simplest would be if that electric field goes right along the length of the conductor, let's say this is one volt per mile electric field in that direction, and that line is 100 miles long, that means it's going to get 100 volts induced in the line. If the electric field were perpendicular to the line, there would be no induced voltage in the line. Um, when we model these, we integrate the electric field along the length of the line, and then we model them as little DC batteries superimposed in our lines. So this could be a 500 kV transmission line. It would have ADC phases in there. Each one of those wires has a resistance associated with it. It's got a now a DC voltage source superimposed in there. And you just end up having to solve a simple circuits problem, what we all probably did in high school. I've got a battery in series with the resistor, maybe another resistor, another resistor. This is the resistance of the transmission line. This is the resistance of the transformers. This is the resistance of the substation grounding. And I just solved that circuit. Okay, so are there any questions on this so far? Uh huh. So with the uh, electric field as it relates to just the physical layout of the grid, there's got to be a lot of assumptions made in deciding what voltage to put on the battery. Uh, can you go over any of those kind of assumptions? If, you know, if the lines are not perpendicular or sort of perpendicular. Right, there, 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 a, there's a ton of assumptions yeah. here. And we're going to get into a lot of those assumptions, okay? But the, the easiest place to start, and this is where NERC started as well, and it's actually not that far off of where NERC is at right now, is to assume a uniform electric field. It's the same everywhere. If you have a uniform field, then it's really just the dot product of the electric field with the line between the two points. In a uniform field, actually, the conductor path does not matter. Whether it has right, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It's what we call path independent. So as long as I know where that bus is, or more likely where its substation is, I know what induced voltage is on that line. a circuits problem. Every line gets its own little battery. So it, it becomes solving a, a, a circuit problem. And, and in the West, you would have thousands of lines. So every line has its own little battery in it. You may think that's hard to solve, but we solve power flows, which are AC. This is actually much simpler to solve. The same techniques we can use for solving the power flow, we can use to solve these networks. In fact, when I was at the JSON presentation, I looked at what they presented. It's like, that's easy to do. As power engineers, we know how to solve these networks. It's what we do in the power flow, except it's easier. Uh, an important point here is all the things that we think about, or the major things like reactants of the line, that goes away, it's DC. Capacitors look like open circuits. There's no flux or anything in your transformers. Your transformers just look like a coil, which looks like a resistor. And the three phases are in parallel. This is DC, there's no AC here. But you do have to know how well your substation is grounded, something that we don't care about in the power flow. Now, sometimes people will raise the question, um, what resistance are you using there, the 60 hertz resistance or the DC resistance? 
and the values are different because of the skin effect at 60 hertz makes the resistance appear a little bit higher at 60 hertz. Um, but with all the other uncertainties in here, it's usually you just use the AC resistance and you're okay. Uh, another quirk on this is the resistance of a wire, be aluminum or copper, changes at 0.4% per degree C. Okay, so if I say, what's the temperature of that conductor? How do you know the temperature of your conductor? Or if you're doing a planning study, how would you know? What, what would you assume? The so, time of the wet base case. Yeah, right. So it's whatever's in the wet base case. But here, the, in, in a power flow, the reactance and capacitance tend to dominate. Here, there is no reactance. So there's no susceptance, so it's just the resistance, and resistance is temperature dependent. So if you have a 50 degree C variation, you're going to have a 20 degree variation in your resistance values. And that's just how copper and aluminum behave. So are you proposing, Tom, in the future that simulator is going to store temperature, and then we can tell it what we based our topological variables on, like R, X, and B? Yeah, I certainly didn't propose that. <laughs> I mean, it seemed straightforward. It, it, it actually would be straightforward. It, it'd just be another piece of data someone would have to supply. But yeah, it's, it's a straightforward calculation. I looked at this relationship, and yes, indeed, it is very linear over the temperature at which we operate these conductors. We probably have to move through this pretty quick, huh? Um, this, this is what we solved. We just solved uh, that we built this big conductance matrix. We model those voltages in the lines uh, rather as a, as a, they're not modeled as a Norton equivalent or a, a Thevenin equivalent. They're modeled as a Norton equivalent. We solve this and we get DC voltages everywhere in the grid. And that allows us to calculate the GICs in the model, the geomagnetically induced currents. We know of them in every device in the system. So the assumed electric fields produce that DC little battery. We model that as a Norton equivalent. If you don't remember what a Norton equivalent is, don't feel bad. I teach a lot of students, and they don't remember what they are either by the time they get to their power system analysis class. Um, the G matrix here is very similar to the powerful Y bus. We just need some additional information. Scott will be talking about that additional information. If you go back to the earlier slide, I needed to know how that transformer was grounded. That's not in a powerful model. I needed to know whether it was an auto transformer or not. That's not in a powerful model. Okay. So, um, in calculating that, uh, you know, you go through various assumptions. How are the auto trans? What's auto transformers? What's not? That affects it. Uh, where is the transmission to distribution transformers? Uh, usually, transmission to distribution is going to be delta on the high side, grounded Y on the low side. If you have a delta transformer, there's no path to ground, hence the GICs can't get to ground. So it looks like an open circuit. Uh, what's going on with the tertiary windings uh, out here in the west? You guys have series capacitors. A series capacitor is going to look like an open circuit. So if there's a series capacitor in a 500 kV line, that line is modeled with an open circuit in it. So there's no GICs on that line. Solving this, it's trivial compared to solving a power flow. It's a DC system. Factoring the G matrix, it's sparse. It takes no more work than factoring the Y matrix, which we do in the power flow all the time. In fact, it takes less because it's a real matrix, uh, much less than a second for a large system. Okay, so then we get into what about non-uniform electric fields? We started out with uniform electric fields. Non-uniform electric fields get a little bit more complicated, but there are some assumptions that we can make that will make it simpler, and I'll talk about those as we go along. Um, here's an example of a four-bus system. 
in Power World. Uh, just uh, two generators here. You can think about one as an aggregate load. Uh, the generators are grounded Y. They've got their GSUs that are grounded Y on the high side, delta on the low side. So from a GIC point of view, we're really dealing with solving this circuit right here. It just looks like a DC circuit. You need to know what is the substation grounding. Here I assume that substation is grounded with uh, 0.2 ohms. I need to know what is the winding resistance here. What is the resistance of the conductor? What is the winding resistance there? And if I know that, it's just solving the battery circuits that you solved in high school. And uh, getting data, this value, the resistance of the line, we get that from the power flow data. Ideally, people supply the resistance on the transformers, but if they don't, we can guess that from the power flow data. Um, the substation grounding resistance is something that would need to be supplied. If not, we have default values, but they're just defaults. Okay, so there's the WCC where I just took a WCC model. I put a uniform 5 volt per kilometer east-west field on it and solved for the GICs, and then I used Power World's flow visualization with a yellow arrow to visualize the GICs. And do the lights in the front turn off? Just the front? Yes. Try, try turning out the lights. See if we can... Maybe not. Like, yeah, I, I, we could. Maybe do that. Yeah, so you can see it now. Uh, that is trivial to compute, and I just use default data on this. Now, the field is going uh, east to west, but most of, most of those arrows look like they're going from uh, west to east. Well, it. it yeah. I, I didn't say east to west, I said east to west. I, I don't, it, 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 the, it turns out with GIX, they're symmetric with respect to 180 degrees. But yeah, if I, if I flipped it around, they would go the other direction. So I, I don't know, this might have been a west to east field. But yeah, the electric field direction drives the GIX. Whether they go one direction or the other, the impact on the grid is the same. But what does make a difference is if you change the direction between east-west and north-south. If you go north-south, then you can see, I guess, south-north. Most of them are going up like that. As we were debugging the initial code, one of the students was giving me values, and I would plug them in. I was look at the flow directions, and a lot of times they didn't look like this. I'm like, you got some errors in your code. And then he finally fixed them, and suddenly they all looked like they were going in one direction. It's like, yes, <laughs> we got it. So. Um, so then the next point is to say, how do we determine the storm scenario? The idea in the storm scenario is we have to work with the space weather community to figure out what are the appropriate storms to consider. And we're working on that. The GICs vary linearly with the assumed electric field, and the impact on the power grid varies linearly with that. So now we're going to go to here, which is the Earth conductivity model, which is saying, how do we get this electric field from a storm? And this gets into the stuff that Maybe some of us, when it was presented to us as sophomores in electrical engineering, might have decided we wanted to be power engineers. So, these are the Maxwell-Faraday equations that talks about relationships between the uh, B vector and the E vector. I just put them there so people have them. Uh, if you have, well, the relationship between a change in B, DT, and E can 
be thought of as coming from Lenz's law. And Lenz's law says the direction of any induced current is always in a way to oppose the change that produced it. So if you've got a changing magnetic field, you know, you may have done an experiment early on in, in your engineering career where you change the B through, through a coil by moving a magnet or something, there's going to be an induced electric field that's going to oppose it. That's what Lenz's law says. How much that current is affects what sort of induced voltages you get. I mean, it's something that we take advantage of all the time. These induced fields tend to cancel the magnetic field variation, leading to decreased fields. Um, that's something that we have to take into account because for us, what's going to go on is that change in the electric, or the change in the current in the Earth is going to cancel some of that B and it's going to reduce the electric field that we see. Okay, some of this depends upon what's known as the skin depth. That's an equation for skin depth. At 60 hertz, aluminum and copper skin depth is about one inch. When you start looking at low frequency fields in the Earth's crust, which is a semiconductor, so you might say the conductivity of the crust is 0 0.01 Siemens per meter. The skin depth turns out to be 50.3 kilometers. So what's going on below the surface has a, quite an impact here. So when we go through frequency domain analysis, and this is what you have to do, you get right down here, there's an equation. I guess I put it over there. That equation there is relating how a change in V at a particular frequency affects an electric field at a particular frequency. So the reason why frequency becomes an issue here is because different frequencies penetrate the Earth's crust to different amounts. If I assume a uniform crust, I can calculate for a particular frequency. Here I said, okay, let me assume a uniform conductivity of the crust of 0 0.001 Siemens per meter and a 500 nanotesla per minute maximum variation. Uh, so that means it's changing at about 1 500 of a hertz there. Go through the calculations and I get 2 volts per kilometer induced field along my line. That turns out to be about what the induced voltage was seen during the Quebec collapse. And this value here turns out to be the pretty good assumption for the conductivity in the crust around the Quebec region. Okay. If you have a uniform crust underneath you, life's pretty easy. You guys don't have a uniform crust underneath you in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the takeaway is a more resistive Earth gives higher electric fields because there's less cancellation. This is a, a diagram where I, you can't see it too well there, but it shows the conductivity of different types of material that might be in the crust. Um, Topsoil varies with moisture. You might have, a, I, I guess I say it in resistivity here, you might have a resistivity of 2,500 ohm meters when it's dry to 20 ohm meters when it's wet. This is the different types of uh, round material. It's hard to see there. This is um, the, that's resistivity and that's conductivity. Conductivity is just the inverse of resistivity. It's given both ways. Okay, just, one's just the inverse of the other. So what tends to be done currently in the state of the art is we use what's known as a 1D Earth model. That's to say the Earth's crust can be modeled as pancakes stacked up at varying depths. And then you can actually go through calculations with these different pancakes that relate a particular B to a particular electric field. And Power World supports the ability to model these pancakes. It does, it's a recursive equation that we go through. Uh, the details are there if you get motivated to review this stuff. I'm a power person and I, I forgot all this stuff 
until I got back into it, and then I'm like, oh, I, like I wish I'd forgotten it. But um, it, it's there, the diff, there's reflections that occur off the different layers. I mean, it's not that's something we as power engineers deal with a lot. What is going on right now is NERC is using a USGS map in which they've broken the uh, US and actually Canada as well up into different regions. And as we calculate the GICs, we make different assumptions for different regions as to what is the induced electric field in those regions. Where Scott and I used to be in central Illinois, we're in this region where it's pretty boring. I'm now on the more towards the Gulf Coast. My region is kind of boring. Your region is less boring. <laughs> if you look at an Earth model for one of the regions, this is what the conductivity of the Earth is going down from 100 meters a kilometer, 10 kilometers, 100 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers. Um, it gets more uncertain as we go down further. Okay, so we might know what it is within the first kilometer down, but when you start getting down 100 kilometers, these are the air bars on the assumptions there. That's a log scale. So they think it's between this value, but between maybe a factor of 100. Okay. Using these sort of assumptions, you can calculate how the electric field changes for different magnetic field assumptions at different frequencies for different regions. Some regions have little impact, some regions have high impacts. Here's one, you can just go out to the website if you get bored, you go out there and it has a clickable map where you can click on each of these regions. So I'm making up these slides. I clicked on the CS1 region, which is the Cascade Mountains, and there it is. And if you had to guess, it's about 100. But there's these are the bars. There's, in your Cascade Mountains, a lot of uncertainty in dealing with that. We we use the built-in assumptions. You can model the layers in Power World, and you can import, export it to an aux file. I don't think we've gone through and put in the resistivity values for each of the layers because ultimately what they end up with is a scaling value that NERC publishes, and we allow you to use those scaling values. What we have is we've got all of these regions defined in a file where they show the lat longitude, and then each region has a scaling value. So when you, when you analyze the grid or the WCC, you can load that file, and that file has a particular value for that region, that region, that region there. That's a uniform value. Value it's a uniform, it's a scaling value for that region. Yes. Is it right? Scaling no. Is a uniform thing. Well, it, it's, a, it, it's a uniform direction field, but it, the field actually, uh, it gets more complicated. It, it scales with magnetic, geomagnetic latitude, and then it's scaled by the region. But right, right now, one at, NERC is using a 1D regional model, and those are the boundaries for it. Okay, we're working on a project for BPA, and it's also, we're also working on an NSF model with the Earth modelers. Jennifer Gannon is the person we're working with who used to be with USGS and now is with her own company that uh, we're working with at, at the University, Texas A&M, and also Power World. What they're saying is the Earth is not a bunch of stacked pancakes. It's much more complicated. So you need a 3D model. A 1D model says everything's uniform in the XY direction, only changes as pancakes going up down. The 3D model says it's much more complicated than that. So uh, the National Science Foundation has a project where they're going around 
and they're actually injecting stuff into the earth, just electric fields, and modeling the response to get a 3D model of the earth. If you think 1D models are complicated, actually they're pretty friendly. The 3D models are complicated. <laughs> and we're not sure what to do with this. But on our project, we went in and we did a particular storm in the Pacific Northwest footprint. And these images show how the electric field varies. I, I was having dinner with Jen Gannon last night. And I was asking her, I said, Jen, is this region right here where the fields are always high? Is that like consistently going to be high? And she said, yeah, it's consistently going to be high for a particular direction of field. But this region here, evidently, if we believe their scope data, is very high uh, in terms of the induced field. There's also another one out in, in this region here. And that's just what's in the ground. So. How does this relate to power system modeling? It's still a research topic. So where we're at um, commercially and with NERC is the 1D models. Where this research might go is improved 1D models. We know the 1D models are not correct, but you know, <coughs> it's the best we can do. So what would be the reason? Is it mother nature or just ocean desiders or just the land of the soil or what is it? What is it that underneath? It's the rock it's the rock structure underneath. It's everything that grows underneath this. Right. It's everything underneath. It it goes down deep. There are also that's not reflected here, there's also coastal effects because when you're dealing with salt water, salt water is a really good conductor. So when you're by the coast it will actually bend the electric fields as well. So we did a project at Power World where we used very detailed models for a PGM study, and the coastal effects played a role there. How much? How much it will for you guys? Just because you don't have a it, you don't have a lot of stuff by the coast here, um, and it doesn't go more than maybe ten miles inland. How much Puget Sound would affect it? I don't know. I mean. This stuff is all getting worked out, but we have to move the ball forward, you know, one step at a time. Got a quick question on the same map. Uh huh. Is that the Earth's conductivity, or is that the new voltage? On the, this the is Earth, this is showing the induced electric field that you get for a particular geomagnetic storm. And we're this is a research project, so we had just gotten these out earlier in 2016. Okay, so the next step is relating the GICs to the power system. And the way the GICs impact the power system is they shift the AC waveforms in the transformers. You get a DC offset on your AC waveform. So the DC just superimposes on the AC. That pushes your AC waveform up in the transformer, it'll push your transformer into saturation for part of the cycle. So you get an asymmetrical waveform for the magnetizing current for your transformer. If you did a harmonic analysis on this, you would get even and odd harmonics. Harmonics, And the GICs in the positive sequence cause an increase in reactive power losses in the transformer. They also cause increased heating because of the extra harmonics in the transformer. So Power World uses a scaling factor where we relate the power flow or transient stability increased megabar losses in the transformer to a scaling factor, the gits we see in the transformer, and the per unit voltage across the transformer. In a transformer, we calculate what's known as the effective GIC, which takes into account that the losses you see in a transformer depends on the GICs you get in each coil of the transformer. If it's a GSU where you've got grounded wire on the high side, the low side is delta. The low side doesn't play a role, so it's just the high side. If it's an auto transformer, this equation becomes quite important. 
but that's all something that we calculate automatically in the software. Um, it can get confusing as you talk about GICs. One, and particularly, one of the issues is when I say a GIC in a transformer is 100 amps, am I saying 100 amps per phase or 100 amps total? There's three phases and they're in parallel. Um, the way the industry seems to have standardized is on a per phase value, and that's what's used in Power World. So when we say 100 amps, we're talking 100 amps per phase. There's we do with the AC threads anyway, it's per phase. Well, right. So, oh. yeah. But it, it's confusing because when you look at the neutral, there's only one neutral. So the GIC monitors are on the neutral. So if I say I've got 100 amps in the neutral, that doesn't mean I have 100 amps per phase. It means I've got 100 divided by 3 amps per phase. But when we talk about it, usually we're talking about the phase values. But it's confusing. I totally want to multiply it by the square root of 3 myself. So. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you multiply it by square root of 2 and divide by square root of 3. Oh, it's better. Yeah, that's better. So we, we include both for you, Tracy. Thank you. That's a better. Right. It, it actually gets more confusing with these K values, um, but we're hoping the industry standardizes on approach that uh, Ray Walling from, he used to be with GE, proposed, which is using a per unit approach on the K value. You don't have to worry about this, but we use a per unit approach so Tracy can multiply by square root of 2 and divide by square root of 3. Uh, luckily, the software does this for you. Yeah. So then where we're at is enhanced power flow analysis software to handle GMDs. And that's where Scott's going to take over. Um, I will say what I, what I want to get across to people is you don't want to wait for a GMD to occur before you prepare for it. And I, I've been saying this for a while, and you know, NERC is doing this now that it's required or will be required going forward. But it could be a rather difficult day from an operations point of view. And the, the idea is you want to protect your system and plan for it. Uh huh. Uh, so, since Sister Reef has come into play to translate the uh, induced gear to actual uh, GMDs, what's the difference between is there just an assumed hysteresis curve for the transformer? Because that's not a typical bit of data that's supplied with like the regular power flow data. No, it's not it's not power flow data. The K values are are transformer dependent. The one that's the easiest to deal with is single phase transformers, which you probably have a lot of at the five hundred KV level. They're for those, there's widespread agreement what the K value should be. It doesn't vary a lot with transformer design. For the three-phase transformer designs, it does vary some. It tends to be less than the single phase. We have defaults put in there, but ultimately you would want people to tell you those values. You would, if you're a utility and you're really serious about this, you'd have to work with the manufacturer of the transformer to get to that value. But yeah, the K values are important. For the single phase, there's widespread agreement what it should be. It's what our default is. And, yeah. and, and the numbers that are in simulator are also kind of worst case for the single phase. I think like the shell, the three phase. Well, for the single shell phase, forms and there's things the, like that, they have. Uh, the single which, phase is, there's pretty good agreement on the single phase. And people. Uh, auto transformers. Is the effect more severe on auto transformers? It's not. It's it's not more severe. You just have to model them correctly, which is what we do. You generally have gig current in the whole coil, as opposed to uh, if it's a step up. If it's a GSU, uh, the the low side is probably delta. So you just have a single coil. So it's a lot simpler. And let me just say this so. right at the end. Um, the GICs tend to concentrate at network boundaries. And a lot of times, because the GICs, you kind of see them flowing through the system. When they get to the end, they don't have anywhere else to flow. So they go into the ground. So sort of along the way, they're not as bad. And, well, I mean, they can be bad, but 
certainly at network boundaries, they get to be an issue. We did a study for Wisconsin and Michigan and Illinois, and there the Great Lakes get a lot of gigs for the generators right on the Great Lakes, and it's the GSUs that bear the brunt of it. You know, they're using the lake for the cooling water, so they're all lined up. They're all lined the up on the lake. And then you've got a high voltage line that carries it to the rest of the system away from the lake. Yeah, so this this place there in New Mexico might be getting along. Pretty east west. How long does a GMD event The GMD event can occur for days of varying intensity. So it could come on quick and it could last for days, but it's not intense the whole time because when you get a field the field is going to be going up and down as the storm is hitting and it's not going to be high intensity everywhere all the time that's where a lot of controversy is is to say okay you're not going to have a five volt per kilometer field across the entire west it's going to be changing it, it as we get into more, it'll be scaled potentially by the different regions. But yeah, the storm could go on for days.